Matthew chapter 1. You know, many times when we look in the world around us, maybe you look at, uh, at maybe some of the people in affliction and agony um, on the street downtown, maybe you look at a certain place in this world, maybe you look at a certain life or even a maybe part of your own life and you say, you know what, that's just God forsaken, man. I mean, that, that place, that life, that, that area of the world, it, it just really seems God-forsaken. Who, who's ever heard that term? Oh man, that's just a God-forsaken place, right? Now, folks, when we think about that, though, this morning, that could not be any less true. You see, God has never forsaken us. We have forsaken God, if anything. And this morning, we see in our passage of scripture to start out with that indeed it is God's uh, desire to be with his people to be with you and me who is created for the very purpose you're designed uh, specifically to fellowship and to worship and bring glory to your creator for all eternity there's nothing else that you're better suited for that will, will give your life meaning and, and fulfillment and, and more, more so that will bring glory to your Creator. Worship Him that, and, and fellowship with Him. But of course, there's a problem. That problem is called sin. Sin separates us from our Creator from the Father in heaven who seeks to be with us and seeks to be a Father unto those who are willing to be His children. And here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, we see God reversing the desperate mad dash that all the human race was going towards, the, the, the abyss, the eternal separation the permanent death from God. Whenever we read in the Bible, but God, we ought to stop. We ought to get excited because usually it's going to get really, really good. Whenever God gets into a scene, whenever God enters a life, things change. Amen? Do you remember when God entered your life? Do you remember when and how things changed? Amen? Folks, whenever God showed up, any passage in the New Testament you look at where Jesus Christ enters your life and that person is receptive of the Lord, that life has changed every single time. I mean, there was many a funeral even where Jesus showed up and he ruined the funeral. He ended it, <laughs> you know. Um, when Jesus shows up, things change. Matthew 1 verse 21 is where we want to read this morning. Matthew chapter 1 in verse 21. <clears throat> The Bible says there, and she talking about Mary, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Remember, sins is what was separating us from our God, right? Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, of course, Matthew is referring to the prophet Isaiah here, and the Holy Spirit really wanted to make sure that as non-Hebrew speakers would really get the meaning of Emmanuel because the very word Emmanuel means God with us. And now they didn't make a mistake when they named him Jesus, as we just see in verse 21, hey, um, because Emmanuel was one of Christ's titles, God with us. And his name Jesus or Yeshua means Jehovah saves. And what a fitting name. But this morning I want to think a little bit about that reality. God 
with us. I want to think this morning a little bit about God moving into your home. God hanging out here in our church this morning. God walking with you. God speaking with you. God wanting to spend time with you to get to know you and most of all for you to get to know him. God with you and with me this morning. How many times do we stop on our life and recognize God's presence? And his desire for us to put our attention to him, God with us. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, this morning we recognize how unworthy we are of your love, of your holy presence. Lord, what a wonderful, magnificent God you are. Lord, the creator of the universe, and yet you would stoop down upon these specks of dust on this little globe, and you would have nothing, no greater desire in your heart than to want to spend time with us and be with us. Lord, how could we ever fathom that? We certainly are thankful for it. We certainly receive it by faith. And Dear God, this morning, I pray that you would do supernatural work in each and every one of our hearts. Lord, in my heart, Father, we need you more than ever. Lord, we live in a world that's not forsaken by God, but that's very fast forsaking God. And Lord, God forbid that among your people, we would neglect, we would ignore you or we would rebel against you. Father, I pray that this morning, if there's anyone here that is not saved, that you would do the work of conviction and of regeneration in their heart and that they would trust your Savior. Lord, I pray if this morning there is a believer here that's maybe struggling, that's hurting, that is um, maybe straying and battling with sin or the flesh. And Father, whatever you know we're going to face and whatever you know that we need we pray that your spirit through your word will give it to us and lord we'd humble ourselves we'd receive it we trust you and we'd obey you lord bless us now father and help me to preach this message from your word lord i ask in jesus name amen if almighty god God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, if the thrice holy trinity would choose this morning to move into your home or your home or your home, let me ask you this. How would you react? How would you respond? When we look at the scriptures, what would be some good biblical responses? I want to bring out this morning just three. Three biblical reactions to God dwelling with us. And for the first reaction, I want to actually turn back to the Old Testament, to the prophet of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 2 in verse 10 now, admittedly, the context there, of course, in regards to this prophecy is slightly different than what you and I experience today, um, seeing that we are not Israel, seeing that um, this is referring to a specific time in God's plan with the nation of Israel. But the fact of the matter remains the same, because we see here God's um, desire expressed to be with His people, to be with, with you. To be with you, to, to be with me. And just think about that. God would want to be with me? Dwell among us? Restore and reconcile us back to him? The first reaction this morning. Singing and rejoicing. Zechariah 2 verse 10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come. And I will dwell in the midst of of thee saith the Lord. This is a stunning statement that God would choose to dwell with his sinful, fallible, continuous, rebellious people and be willing to restore them unto himself. That is really a love. 
I mean, just the sheer fact that the, the almighty creator of trillions of galaxies would somehow fit into your home or my home is a miracle as far as I'm concerned, amen? <laughs> um, and you know what, there's, there's no point in, you know, sweeping out the rugs real quick and, you know, dusting all the corners um, because God is always there. He already knows how your home looks like, all right? <laughs> there's no point in hiding anything from him anyways. But you know how we ought to react? Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Sing and rejoice. The context there when we look into verse 8 and 9 is um, God uh, restoring his people after they've been afflicted, they've been really judged by their enemies, and God allowed that. And, and of course, God always br uses that to bring them to repentance. And, and ultimately, this is, of course, uh, referring to God's ultimate restoration of Israel in the millennial kingdom. But verse 8 says this, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you, toucheth the apple of his eye. Folks, this is a truth, this is a truth that is true to this very day about the nation of Israel. Whoever touches God's Old covenant people, the Jewish people, is as foolish as the person who pokes in their own eyeballs. God is not mocked. God has given the honor of his name to the promises that he's given Israel. And anyone who's ever dared to uh, destroy, to hate, um, or to go against the Jewish people, sooner or later, folks, has been destroyed. I know a little bit about that. I've moved here from Germany, amen? I know a little bit of German history. Um, and anywhere you, you look throughout history, folks, um, God takes serious the care of his Old Testament people. Um, God takes serious the care of your life and my life too, by the way, through a covenant in Jesus Christ. But he moves on there in verse 11 and says, And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, notice again, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Oh, there'd be so much we could learn out of this passage. But folks, I want to focus on the Two mentions of, I will be in the midst of thee. And notice how he starts out by expressing how they really ought to react to that. Sing and rejoice. Sing and rejoice. Folks, that's why it is fitting for us to celebrate, to rejoice, to sing about rejoicing and, and honoring and, and thanking and worshiping our God and the Father in heaven who sent Jesus Christ not just to be born as a cute little baby, meek and mild, in Bethlehem, but also to be judged cruelly and brutally for the awful guilt and the terrible crimes that you and I have committed against God's holiness. And also to be restored and, and, and to be honored and as he's gone up to heaven, now sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, waiting for the day where he will stand up and be the judge of the whole world world folks that is a great reason to sing and to rejoice doesn't god know that right now I, it's it's not really going great that right now in this world i don't have very much reasons to rejoice or to sing oh he certainly knows that and he tells you to cast all your cares upon him by the way but folks our reason to sing and to rejoice isn't in this world. It's not how your health is. It's not how your finances are looking like. It's, it's, it's not how your family loves you or not or any of these things or how stressful your schedule is. No, our reason to sing and rejoice is out of this world and came into this world to die on the cruel cross for us, to reconcile us back to God who loves us and when I take us to be with Him in heaven from whence He came. Folks, we got so much reason to sing and rejoice this morning. I want to turn over to the New Testament, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. <clears throat> in 
Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, where I believe we see one reason there to sing and rejoice because God's timing is always perfect. Galatians 4 verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Aren't you thankful this morning that God, the Almighty Father in heaven, calls you His son and His daughter? Calls you His son and His daughter? Praise the Lord for that, the adoption of children through Jesus Christ. But notice, when the fullness of time was come, say, what does this mean? This means that when all the preparations had been finished, when everything was ready and the time was ripe, when it was according to God's designated time on, on His calendar, so to speak. And of course, we read all about that in, in, in the book of Daniel and so forth. In other words, when it was God's right time. Now, I think we all struggle with this at times, but folks, the fact of the matter is, the truth is, God is always on time. Not on my time. <laughs> but he's always on the perfect time, on his time, amen? God's always right on time. He's never late and seldom, or rather never, early, amen? And praise the Lord for that. Folks, Ephesians 1 verse 11 still says that he works all things according to the counsel of his own will. And that kind of a God is coming to you and to me this morning and says, I, I want to dwell with you. I want to be God with you, with us. Not just is God's timing perfect, God's details are perfect as well. All the way back in the book of Joshua, in Joshua 23, verse 14, Joshua already recognized that when he uh, told the children of Israel that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you. And not one thing has failed thereof. In other words, God has kept all His promises to you people. There's over 300 promises, over 300 prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ's birth, sinless life, miracles, ministries, teachings, His death on the cross for our sins, His burial, His resurrection. Christ's birth was promised and fulfilled exactly the way it was prophesied. And that's the reason to sing and rejoice too, folks. You know, you know there's no oopsies with God. There's, there's no details that just kind of, oh, happened that way. Um, or, well, he just overlooked that part. No, 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 no. God knows what he's doing. And he's coming into your life and my life this morning, and he says, I, I want to be with you because I know what I'm doing. Are you going to allow me in? Are you going to trust me, God, with us? You know, the details matter, don't they? And when the details get messed up by uh, myths and legends and, and uh, human traditions, um, as we see specifically around the, uh, the, the miracle of Christ's birth, unfortunately, uh, things can get really muddled up, don't they? Um, you know, I, I was thinking if, if you would <clears throat> invite somebody over, and let's say they accidentally got the wrong address. Instead of, I don't know, 885, they got 895. So now they're going to go knock on your neighbor's door and there's probably going to be some very grumpy and grouchy neighbor because they understood 7 a.m. instead of 7 p.m. And the neighbors ain't very happy. <laughs> Why? Well, because the details matter, don't they? And let's think about Christ's birth. We notice, for example, that there's 400 years of silence from God all the way from the prophet of Malachi to the prophet of John the Baptist. Now, similar, we also see in the Old Testament, 400 years of silence from Joseph in Egypt all the way until God raises up Moses. We see Israel was oppressed for 400 years under slavery in Egypt uh, before the Exodus. And when Christ brought full salvation, uh, the nation of Israel was under 400 years 
of pagan control of the Greeks and Roman empires as well. And we could go on and on and on. Um, we could look, for example, at the date of Christ's birth, which, by the way, was definitely not during wintertime and was not on December 25th. I hope you know that. That's a pretty arbitrary date uh, that we've chosen in our culture to remember it. But it is really very unlikely that the shepherds would have watched their flock during the cold and rainy winter season in Israel out on that open field. Um, so that's why you know, some people suggest it probably was springtime. It probably wasn't summer because Mary and Joseph were traveling. That was usually not done in, in summer because of the heat. Um, some suggest that when you look at the information of John the Baptist's birth and of, uh, uh, of Zechariah's turn in the temple, that was John the Baptist's father, and, and you line that up with Mary and Elizabeth and so forth, and the six months difference, um, some people suggest you can calculate maybe late September or early October as the date of his birth. But you know what? That really doesn't matter that much. On which day I was born. As long as you know that you are born again in him this morning. Amen? That is, more than matters, uh, that is what matters more than anything. Are you born again in Jesus Christ this morning? And there's so many other things that are very neat and very interesting um, uh, that we could consider. You know, for example, that donkey that Mary did most likely not ride on because <laughs> they were poor um, and could have never afforded such a luxury. Plus, it would have been impractical. Um, and, you know, there's the whole thing about uh, the, uh, the inn, which was most likely not a paid hostel, but just a filled up guest room at Joseph's family. And we don't see innkeeper anywhere in the Bible. When we realize that Jesus was put after his birth into a manger, which is like a feeding trough, a container for animal food, which was usually built out of stone around Bethlehem. When we realize that Mary was an adult woman of marrying age and not that 13, 14 year old teenager. Uh, or simply a young woman that, that you know, modern theologians teach us, which is really despicable, to be honest, because they're trying to rash, rational away the fact that Mary was a virgin, that she had not been with any man, and that is very important. Because it proves Christ's heavenly origin, and it proves that he's completely sinless. If Jesus would not be sinless, he could not be your Messiah and your Savior. He could not die for somebody else's sins. We could go on and on. We could consider the fact that we don't know how many wise men there were. It was probably not three. could have easily been a dozen, but they were for sure at least two because they're plural. Um, that they did not come to the manger where Jesus was born like the shepherds. They came probably up to two years later and met King Jesus in a house there in Bethlehem and worshiped him. Um, we could look at the parallel from Israel's exodus, how uh, the God-defying Pharaoh um, it killed all the Hebrew uh, infants, and how King Herod, of course, uh, after Christ's birth there in Bethlehem, massacred all the infants as well. And yet in both times, God preserved his deliverer. God looked out for Moses in the Old Testament, and God looked out for the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament and kept him and Mary and Joseph safe. Uh, folks, the details matter, amen? And, and I'm, I'm mentioning some of these things because my desire is this morning that we sing and rejoice about how great our God is and what a miracle that He would come down into human form and that He would want to be with you and with me this morning. That we would exalt Him in our hearts once again. One last detail that I think is exceedingly significant, especially these days, and that is the fact that even though Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he was not a Palestinian. Amen? Jesus was not a Palestinian, folks. Jesus Christ was a descendant of Abraham and Jacob and of David. And over 2,000 years ago, Bethlehem was a small town in Judea, not Palestine. That name did not appear until almost... 200 years after Christ's birth. 
And that name was taken from the Greek Philistine invaders during King David's days, by the way, <clears throat> that at that point had long disappeared. There was never a country or state called Palestine or a Palestinian nationality in the land of Israel until about the 1960s when Yasser Arafat, by the way, supported and funded by the Communist Soviet Union, went on international TV and demanded a state for the Arab people who, by the way, had invaded the Jewish homeland around 600 years after Christ lived. And so anyone, as so many do th these days, who claim that Jesus was a Palestinian is not just historically ignorant, they're also really a Forgive me, a demonic liar. Do you know why? Because our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, was prophesied to be born of the Jews, was, be bo uh, was prophesied to be born of the house of David, and was prophesied to be born in the city of Bethlehem, Judea, in Israel. Matthew 2, verse 21, And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. Matthew 2, verse 6, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Luke 2, verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And we could go on and look at so many um, interesting things that teach us so much, but for the sake of time, we have to move on to our second response. Folks, the reason why I mention these details is so that you and I can look at God's promises and God's prophecies and say, you know what, my God's been faithful. If God could keep over 300 promises to Israel through Jesus Christ, why would I doubt His faithfulness to provide for my needs today? Why would I doubt His timing in my life, not my timing, His timing, and His perfect right on time timing in my life, when he could work out for hundreds and hundreds of years the exact perfect time for Jesus Christ to be born, according to the prophecies. Sing and rejoice, because God can and wants to be in your life this morning. Are you opening the door? The second reaction I want to see in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. The Bible says there and, and gives us Christians some very clear instructions, some very clear commandments. And there's um, a whole list of Old Testament verses that are being referenced or quoted. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to look those all up this morning. But I just want to begin reading there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Communion is, is fellowship, union. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will, notice, dwell in them. I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Once again, fulfilling so many prophecies. God's desire to be with you this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm sometimes stunned that my wife and my children want to be with me, or any of you want to be with me. I don't sometimes feel like being with me. And that God would want to be with me blows my mind. <laughs> Amen? That is love. That is forgiveness and mercy and also truth and righteousness. <clears throat> and they shall be my people. Verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And notice, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The second reaction we ought to have to Christ dwelling in our life is the desire for personal holiness, a desire to, to be loyal to Christ and to His commandments. That's what that is. 
that I choose to be more loyal to Christ and love Him more than I'm loyal and obeying the dictates of the world and of my flesh and of my sin. I separate from that and unto Him. It's a call into fellowship with the Savior. He says there, I will be a father unto you, and she will be my sons. He says, I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their God, and they shall be my people. God with us. If you feel God forsaken this morning, that's not God's fault. That can be remedied very, very quickly. God wants to be with you. Are you going to open the door and let him in? He wants it very strictly from the things that displease God, the things that destroy us, which is called sin, um, and uh, from what is also called idols. And, you know, many times today we think, oh, you know, idols, that's just like back, back in Jesus' day sometime or something like that. And, but let me tell you about an idol that many of us may be worshiping this morning. If you or I are too busy for Jesus Christ, especially this time of year, then we've made Christmas an idol and neglected to worship Christ, who's the true and living God. Folks, it is way too easy, even as a Christian, to be too busy for the Lord, and by default that becomes my idol, whatever it is. The Lord says, you know, I, I need you to separate from that, and I need you to separate yourself unto me. I want to be a father, and I, I want you to be a child unto me. Folks, the closer we spend time in God's fellowship, the more we might feel like, uh, like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, where he uh, entered the, the holy presence of Almighty God in heaven, and he said, woe is me. <laughs> For I'm a man undone. Ho! Oh. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eye have, eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And now God enables him, though, to live as a holy person, a redeemed soul, within an unholy world. And he enables you and me to do the same this morning as well through the instructions of His Word, and through the power of the Holy Ghost in you this morning, if you're saved. Folks, so many times, it just takes one person to stand up for holiness, for what God calls right. So many times, it may just take one person to change the world around you a little bit. Let me illustrate this a little bit. I, I read about um, a conformity experiment performed by Solomon Ash. And Solomon Ash, it, it, it was a, um, a researcher, I guess, at a university back in the 50s and 60s. And so he would have these groups of students um, with, with eight, eight students in each group. And seven of those students were actors. They had been instructed. But one person wasn't. And he made it so that that non-instructed person, the non-actor was always the last person in line. And so what they would do is they would uh, give them <clears throat> two cards with just a simple line on it. And then they would give them a second card with three lines on them, A, B, and C. And they would allow them to compare the two cards. And then they had to decide which one of the lines A, B, and C are matching up with the line on the other card. See, that's not very difficult at all. But the trick was that eight, excuse me, that seven of these eight people had been instructed to all choose the wrong line. Let's say line B. And they were all 100% acting like they were convinced that, hey, line B is exactly the same length as this line. And one after another, they said, oh, B, B, absolutely, for sure. Guaranteed, it's B. And so at the end of the line, the person was an unacted. They're like, duh, it's not B. Like, everybody can see that. But you know what? Because everybody else saw it, because everybody else did it, because everybody else thought it. Oh, yeah, B. 
as well. Over 30% rather agreed with the majority, knowing that they were really wrong, than disagreeing with the majority. Then they redid this experiment a little bit. And they had just one other person join the non-actor and saying, no, 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 B is wrong. It's another line. And all of a sudden, the percentage was way higher of people who are willing to say the right thing, who are willing to say the truth, as long as there was just one other person standing with them as well. Folks, sometimes that's all it takes. Standing up for God, standing up for holiness and righteousness, doing what's right, even when everybody else is doing what God calls wrong. The Holy Spirit is called holy for a reason. And the more we want to fellowship with God's Holy Spirit, the more we have to be willing to learn His holiness as well. Joy in singing, holiness and fellowship, God wants to be with us. But lastly this morning, as we look into the future, I want to talk about the third reaction, and that's a comfort and expectation that we've been given. I want to turn all the way to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Well, once again, folks, throughout the whole Bible, we see this very theme that God's desire is to be with His people. And Jesus Christ came into this world not just to be born in a cute little manger, uh, not just so we could have good food or gifts or any of that stuff. That, 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 you know, if that is what is our focus, that's idolatry. No, our focus is the Lord Jesus Christ, not just that He was born, but that He died and rose again, all so that we could be with Him. Folks, God help us if we can't get excited about that this morning, because that is really all that matters. Joy comes by fellowshipping with Jesus again. Peace on earth and goodwill among men comes only when we're fellowshipping with the Prince of Peace. Amen? And we probably know all that, but I think we definitely need to be reminded all the time, don't we? But as we look forward into the future, we see an expectation and comfort that the Lord gives us that we will spend all of eternity with him and in his presence. It says there in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. Be their God. Wow. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, and neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. What a comfort, amen. What a hope to live for. What an expectation to live for. To not just fellowship God with us right here, right now, but that we'll be able to spend an eternity with Him doing that as well. You know, we might as well start with heaven already, don't you think? Whenever we fellowship with Jesus Christ, whenever you walk with the Lord today, you're already getting to enjoy a piece of what you'll enjoy one day for eternity in heaven if you're saved this morning. If you're not saved, by the way, today is the best day to trust in Jesus Christ who came in this world to die for your sins. And He rose again and He loves you. And He wants you to come to Him simply by faith this morning. We live in a world of scoffers and mockers. And Peter already knew that. He said that they'll come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts in 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's say, where's the promise of His coming? Oh yeah, sure, God's going to come back. When, huh? Well, when it's the right time. When God decides it's the right time, just like He did with the Lord Jesus Christ in His first coming. Oh no, the Lord's not slack concerning His promise. Some men can't slack this. No, the Lord is long-suffering to us. God's not forgetting on His promise. God's not breaking His promise. 
He just may have a different timeline than you and I do. Are we ready for the Lord to return, to take us into that eternal fellowship with Him, God with us? God wants to be with us this morning. Do you want to be with Him? He's literally left heaven. He literally came embodied in human form. And He literally suffered the wrath and punishment of your sin and my sin, all so that you could be with Him this morning. He's waiting. He says, this weekend, this week, this next year, God's plan throughout all the ages has always been for God to be with you. Are you going to take time? Are you going to open your heart and your life and your schedule? And are you going to be willing to say, God, I want to be with you too? How much more could God love you than what he already has loved you in Jesus Christ? She fall, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Folks, I believe this morning, it's, it's really almost fruitless, if not maybe even shameful, to celebrate the miracle of Christ's birth without focusing on the reason for his birth. That Jesus came from heaven into our world to die on a cross for our sins. That whole joy and wonder today is not in Christmas gifts. It's not in lights and decorations. It's not in holiday cheer. It's not in family gatherings. And it's not even in good food, as much as we love it as Baptists. No, no, no. The whole reason for you and I to rejoice and to sing to the Savior today is when we realize and when we remember how without Christ, you were hopeless. You were helpless. You were enslaved in your sins and under the curse of death. But through Christ, through His sacrifice on the cross for you, He took that punishment upon Himself. And He died. He was buried and rose again. And now He's waiting for you to come unto Him. He wants to be with you. Are you going to choose to be with Him? Folks, the greatest reason to cheer and to jubilate today is not a Merry Christmas, but rather a, it is finished. It is finished, amen? And folks, when we focus on that again, we have all the reason to sing and to rejoice because God wants to dwell with me. God wants to be our God and us, His people, His sons and daughters. Hallelujah. What a Savior, amen? I'd like to ask you to please stand, bow your heads, and close your eyes in prayer. Sister comes up to play an invita invitation hymn for us. I appreciate your attention, your patience this morning, but I want to encourage you this morning. God is a God of a perfect timing. God is a God who knows and has all the details under control. God is a God of truth and not of myth and legends. God is a God that loves you and said, I want to be with man. God with us. Are you willing to open your heart and your life to him today?